Um, welcome, everybody, uh, uh, here uh, at the Campus University and also online. Uh, my name is Willem Scholte. Uh, very warm welcome on behalf of uh, Stum Generale. Um, now that we're almost like one month away uh, in a new academic year, uh, we like to explore the, the concept of hope because, well, these are pretty strange uh, times we're living in uh, right now. To name just uh, uh, two major challenges, well, uh, just let's call them problems, I think, uh, uh, which make the question of uh, hope more urgent than ever. Uh, last week, I think, uh, Nature published an article about the, the real existence of uh, the tipping point, or you could say the point of no return, uh, about the, the melting ice in, uh, um, in uh, at the South Pole, uh, marking the... Uh, the climate change, welcome, <laughs> uh, marking the, the, the climate crisis and just uh, uh, yesterday evening our Prime Minister uh, made clear that we are in the dreaded uh, uh, second wave of COVID-19. So well, not the brightest start of the, the academic year, uh, to say the least. But uh, what about never waste a good crisis? Is there uh, light at the end of the corona tunnel? Is there still hope for maybe a better or fair world? Can we solve the, the big problem of climate change? And is there reason to think that the new normal will be better than the old normal? And if so, why? To explore these and other, uh, well, fragile thoughts, you could say, uh, we are in a different setting than uh, normal, uh, also because of the new measurements uh, uh, of the, the, the regulations. Um, we're here with a small, far smaller audience than you're used to, but I'm very happy, thanks to our technical staff, that we can also live stream this. And if you have any questions on the live stream, please put them uh, online. We try to make them uh, answered by our two experts. Uh, just a short sketch of the prog uh, program of today. First, Katharina Bauer will introduce the idea of hope. Um, what kind of hopes uh, are there? And uh, uh, she will, uh, I think, uh, uh, share with us her thoughts about, uh, uh, I think, um, uh, fragile hope, you call it. Uh, Katrine Bauer is an assistant professor of uh, practical philosophy here at Erasmus School of uh, Philosophy. And after her lecture, uh, Dirk Lohbach will introduce his idea on the hopeful positive changes crisis could approach, uh, accomplish. Uh, Dirk is professor and director of Drift, Dutch Research Institute for Transition. Uh, after uh, the, the two talks or statements, uh, Dirk and Katrina will share their thoughts and are, um, are willing to uh, uh, answer any questions uh, in the audience or online. I'm very happy we both have uh, you here. And please, a very warm, well, say, virtual welcome to Katrina Bauer. Yes, thank you for being here or following us online. It's nice to see at least some of you here live in the room. So I'm going to talk about the question, what may we hope, the topic of this evening or this afternoon. Um, and as a philosopher, of course, I cannot discuss the question, what may we hope during the COVID-19 crisis without touching on more fundamental questions. What is hope and how does hope work? And as an ethicist or practical philosopher, I cannot avoid investigating the sophisticated art of good hope and also potential ethical limits of hope in times of crisis. So you can see that I'm practicing the art of good hope in a different way, but that's not what I'm going to talk about today. So let me first start with some examples of the strong hopes that have been expressed during the current crisis. In April, in the midst of the first wave of the corona crisis, the American writer and activist Rebecca Solnit has described these times, quote, as akin to a spring thaw. It is as if the pack ice has broken up, the water starts flowing again, 
and boats can move through places they could not during winter, end of quote. She hopes for breaking, for breaking of the ice of the status quo of power structures and behavior patterns in order to really allow for fundamental change. And Sonnet's statement is only one example of numerous uh, articles and articulations um, of hope in these times, in particular at the beginning of the crisis. Hope for a better new normal, for new solidarity, for economic reforms and social change, hope that we will learn how to cope with other crises, in particular the climate crisis, or very generally that we will gain a deeper understanding and appreciation of life and its details. To give another example, in April as well, the European Environmental Bureau, a network of important NGOs like Greenpeace and WWF, published an appeal to European governments and leaders under the title, Turning Fear into Hope. And it starts with the following passage. With one third of humanity currently in lockdown, people all over the world are learning from the coronavirus pandemic that we cannot take our lifestyles for granted. In the face of fear and suffering, we need to have hope. With governments starting to think beyond the crisis, it is time to decide what we value the most and to share a vision for a better future. So here the crisis is clearly regarded as a chance, a chance to learn. However, in particular, one must say for the privileged um, who have a certain lifestyle that they could take for granted. Um, and as a chance to convince others that we must now take decisive steps to fight the climate crisis, these are the goals of the paper, to stabilize democracies, improve living conditions, and develop a common vision for the future. And what is interesting is that the authors do not only express the hope that these achievements will be possible, but they very strongly underline the need for hope as a condition of facing the respective challenges, as a strong motivational factor within a learning process, stronger and more reliable than the activating force of fear. So in a way, hope here is the answer to fear. And it is true that re some reactions to the corona crisis give us concrete positive examples of change. We saw that quicker political decisions were possible, um, at least for a certain time, there was uh, more respect for vital workers. I hope that it still exists. Uh, in the words of uh, Rutger Brechmann, we could witness an explosion of altruism and cooperation. Uh, maybe we witnessed the start of a healthcare revolution based on progress in dig digital healthcare, for example, and so on. So there are many examples that are also um, introduced to show that hope is justifiable in these days. So we see that changes in policies, the economy, and our individual habits and lifestyles are possible. Or as the science fiction writer Kim Stanley Robinson has nicely put it in an article in The New Yorker, the corona crisis is rewriting our imaginations of ourselves, our individual lives, and our societies. Robinson also expresses the hope that when later shocks strike global civilization, we remember how we behave this time and how it worked. Again, hope that we will learn from the crisis. So there are strong, ho strong hopes for deeper insight, one could perhaps even say a new enlightenment of our knowledge of the world and our sense of self, accompanied by the hope that a new depth of emotions and reflections and a focus on what really matters will increase our readiness to take risks, to fight for a good life and for a better and more just world. The hope to learn from the corona crisis is thus deeply connected to hope that we will put the results of clearer insights into action and really change the world. So now first, I would like to think about how this is possible, how can this work? Which kind of hope do we need if it's really going to be an activating hope that may change things for the better? But after that, I already announced that I will argue for a fragile version of hope and say, well, let's see whether it will really work. So first, let's take a quick, quick look at the question, what is hope? So a, one standard account in modern philosophy is that hope is a desire with the potential to be realized, while this realization is neither certain nor completely impossible. In other words, we want something like social change, there is a chance that it could work, it is not impossible, but the outcome is uncertain. So this is hope as a desire in a way, but beyond that, hope is very often defined as an important or even essential motivational factor for action 
under conditions of uncertainty. We hope for the chance to fulfill a desire or to realize a plan, and it is hope that makes us act upon this desire or plan, even though we are not sure that we will succeed. The idea is that without any hope that our action can bring about a result, be it a smaller goal like perhaps inspiring an audience or a large goal like fighting global warning, warming or reaching justice, we would not act. So here, hope is the antidote to fatalism. So how should we hope in times of crisis? Or what do we need for the art of good hope that is really, can really be understood as an activating motivational force? Well, here I suggest the following philosophical receipt. My basic ingredient of good hope is reasonable hope. This is based on Kant's theory of hope. So for Kant, it is reasonable to hope that what is morally right is compatible with happiness and that one's actions can be efficient contributions to the common good. Hope is reasonable in being an essential motivational condition for striving for a better future. And appeals to hope during the current crisis do not, do not insist on duty or appeal to our bad conscience. They are, I think, also inspired by the idea that a righteous, just, and good life or good actions um, that include being ready to invest something into the common good will ultimately lead to a more happy life for the one who tries to really bring about change, but also for humanity as such, as an end goal in a way. So the idea to put it more simply, is really, it's, it can be worth the effort, um, also on an individual level of potential reward. So I thought, mentioned that this is based on Kant's conception of hope. Honestly, Kant's, him, Kant himself was rather skeptical about the chance to realize a morally just life or good life that is also a happy life, personally, but he insisted on it being at least practically possible, and this is why hope becomes one central aspect of his philosophy, and the question, what may we hope is central for him? The idea is that moral progress, or to put it in less moralistic terms, actions that aim at the better, at improving justice, improving living conditions, respectful interaction, are driven by hope. Kant has regarded the question, what may I hope, as a central question of philosophy, but as Honora O'Neill points out, he turns it into the, the question, what must I hope? If we cannot know it, we must hope that our actions, actions with a good intention, can be efficient and have influence on the real world and on the status quo. Otherwise, we would lose the fundamental motivation to act out of moral reasons. So again, hope is the antidote to fatalism. My first Kantian-inspired answer to the question, what may we hope during the current crisis, is thus, it is reasonable to hope that the experience of the crisis will not paralyze us completely like a shock, but that it can motivate us to bring about actions that can efficiently contribute to the common good. We must hope for it. And accordingly, the Kantian philosopher Susan Neyman has recently stated that in times of crisis, hope is an obligation not only in terms of hope for concrete solutions to the crisis, but for instance also as a hope for overcoming racial discrimination and structural injustices that have become so painfully visible again during the crisis. So, reasonable hope is one of the necessary ingredients of, the, of good hope in times of crisis. The hope that our contributions to the common good are worth the effort and that our actions based on our normative intentions can make a difference in the world. But I want to add another ingredient, rational hope. Rational hope is involved in the efficiency of planning and the possibility of respectful interaction. It is essential for planning the necessary steps to achieve concrete goals of improvement. So the contemporary philosopher, Philip Pettit, defends the rationality of hope, saying that it allows us to keep track of plans and decisions despite uncertainty, and it serves as a protection against the danger of loss of heart when we are planning something and try to realize our plans. So beyond that, he also argues that it is necessary for the possibility of interaction, because whenever we interact, we hope for the reasonability and cooperativeness of the other. We hope for mutual respect of each other as persons. And I think one can say that with regard to the current crisis, this kind of rational hope is involved in all attempts at mastering the crisis, 
in particular because decisions and planning have to face high uncertainty of the outcomes in a situation where no one of us can really fall back on earlier experiences. The cooperativeness of individuals that is necessary to overcome the pandemic in order to make measures such as social distancing or wearing face masks efficient ask for a high amount of hope or for, or one could perhaps also say trust in the reasonability of others and for mutual respect. So we have the Kantian-inspired account of reasonable hope that is directed towards good or better agency. But the conception of rational hope is perhaps a little bit smaller, <laughs> but uh, it, uh, on the other hand said more fundamental because it is fundamental for agency as such. It plays a role in any kind of planning that faces uncertainty and its main function is allowing for general stability and continuity of acting and interacting. Now, this focus on stability in turn means that a theory of rational hope fails to capture the radical hope for change that has been expressed in reaction to the corona crisis. And this is why I would like to add a third ingredient to my philosophical receipt for good hope in times of crisis, which is radical hope. Radical hope is a capacity of hope for new possibilities of the good or of um, ideals of a better world in the face of a devastation of former hopes, in face of radical change of values and visions for the future. So it is, in a way, the capacity of rewriting our imagination of a better future. It is essential for being able to redesign ideals of the good life and for having the courage to throw oneself into a yet incomprehensible future. It is Jonathan Lear, who has developed this idea of radical hope, in a way one could resume it as the capacity to develop radically new hopes when everything that we hoped for and that we, we valued collapses. Is that really the case during the current, current crisis? Will it lead to a kind of a Nietzschean re-evaluation of all values? Well, even though some reactions to the crisis, like the lockdown, social distancing, um, the rules that we have to follow, clearly change the current way of life of many of us, or change an event like this, it is still very unclear what impact on the lifestyle and value sets of societies and individuals these experiences will have in the long run. Still, it seems that in times of crisis, radical hope has to jump in where rational hope fails, and reasonable hope is at least deeply challenged because we lose control of the situation. Because many of our efforts fail and we are confronted with radical challenges of our former hopes. Now, let me mix the three ingredients of good hope together. In time of crisis, we need the reasonable hope that good actions are worth the effort and can make a difference. We must add radical hope that remains open to re-evaluating and reinterpreting those ideals in the face of crisis or radical challenges, being aware of the vulnerability of our commitments and values. And furthermore, for bridging the gulf between normativity, between our ideals of the good or of a better world and reality, so the agency that really can bring about this, these ideals, uh, we need reasonable hope, open for radical innovations of hope in combination with rational hope, essential for the capacity to develop concrete planning models, evaluate the likelihood of their realizations, and preventing us from a loss of heart and enabling us to cooperate on a basis of trust. Now, I already announced that I'm still cautious when it comes to hope in times of crisis. So, after presenting this promising and very hopeful receipt of good hope, I must admit that generally my hope that the crisis will really change the world for the better or make us better is restricted. Humans are creatures of habit, we all know that, and there is a broad variety and diversity of individual experiences of the current crisis that also plays a role. Think about your own experiences. Think about someone who really loses a relative or someone who lives in a favela in Brazil. So it's very unlikely, I think, that it will have a homogeneous effect on everybody uh, and that this will be a positive effect. But more than that, I'm also cautious because of the risk of cheap talk about the crisis as a motor of human progress, according to the motto that Philip had mentioned, never waste a good crisis. So my hope is not, is not only restricted, I also think that our hopes ought to be restricted. 
because of a risk of cheap hope in the face of the fears and the suffering of the most vulnerable. Therefore, I would finally like to argue that good hope, however it is exactly mixed together and composed, always remains a fragile hope. What is that? First of all, accepting the fragility of hope means being aware of the limits of our control. Hope can bring about agency, but at the same time, it essentially confronts us with the limitations of our agency. If we could just do it, we would not need to hope for it. Secondly, fragile hope is a hope that is aware of those who have less to hope for. This can prevent us from using those who are directly suffering from the tragic effects of a particular crisis merely as means, for example, as a poster child to achieve improvements or realizing a political agenda. So using the hope to overcome the corona crisis to activate hope for political and social change in other fields can lead to an exploitation of hope. So I wouldn't say that this is necessarily the case, but it can happen if we are so much occupied by our hope to change the world and use the crisis as a chance that we lose sight of the actual problems of those who directly suffer from the specific consequences of the pandemic and have to bear its costs. My answer to the question, what may we hope during the corona crisis is thus, everything that is not cheap hope at the expense of others or implies using them as mere means to our ends. And thirdly, fragile hope is aware of its own fragility. Hoping well is a sophisticated art, and hope can always fail. Ernst Bloch, who is one of the greatest philosophical defendants of hope, has clearly seen that good hope includes an awareness of its potential disappointment. Otherwise, he says, it would not be hope. And Bloch continues, in fact, hope never guarantees anything. Hope can be frustrated and thwarted, and out of the frustration and disappointment, it can learn to estimate the tendencies of processes that it had possibly estimated incorrectly. Hope can learn and become smart, smarter through damaging experiences, but it can be never driven, of course. End of quote. Some hopes probably must be frustrated and disappointed in order to allow for learning the art of good hope. A hope that cannot be driven, of course, is aware of its own fragility and of the fragility of our conceptions of goodness, of our ideals of the world, in the face of potential changes or disruptions of our value systems. But my idea of fragile hope is also open for our potential to learn from frustration, to care for those who have less to hope for, and to shape and reshape and reinterpret our idea of the good and actively work on change for the better. It is aware of the limits of our agency and control, like the tragic aspects of a pandemic show to us, but also of what is within our control and what we can and ought to change, like, for example, the structural injustices um, in the health system, for example, that the pandemic makes visible. And finally, fragile hope to me also means that in their rush into the future, the defendants of hope should not forget to look back to see what went wrong and where we can learn from the realized and disappointed hopes of the past. So thank you for listening and now I'm looking forward <laughs> to your answer. Thank you, Katharina, for, uh, well, not only opening up this, this meeting on hope, but also pleading, in a sense, for a more open hope, you could almost say. Uh, but before we start a discussion or uh, answer probably, uh, uh, probable questions, I'd like to give the floor first to, to Dirk to hear his thoughts about it. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, th that was excellent. Um, uh, while you were speaking, I was thinking about am I hopeful or not? Uh, and what kind of hope do I have? And I, I, uh, I have to conclude that that is a very personal, uh, particular uh, question. And I find hope a quite unscientific and counterproductive emotion. 
but maybe I'm not a philosopher, so let me explain why I uh, feel that is the case and also uh, bring in uh, this idea of, of tipping points and never waste a good crisis. It's actually a Winston Churchill quote. Naomi Klein uh, uh, paraphrased it as the shock doctrine, um, which is, uh, read this book, which is all about how uh, incumbents, the political po and economic powers that are in position are using the crisis uh, never waste a good crisis to reinforce their position. Uh, like we are now bailing out the fossil fuel industry, and there's a lot of CEOs that are hoping, uh, but actually that is a form of agency, that they are saved, and they are. Um, so um, my background is in transitions, uh, which is societal change. Um, and from our perspective, a lot of colleagues do research on different forms of agency, and part of uh, uh, agency that drives societal change is uh, activists, is entrepreneurs, is people that, that are driven uh, uh, to um, uh, establish something better. So they have the idea that they can uh, uh, develop a better alternative, a better product, a better solution. Or a Part of their motivation is that they are driven by uh, um, what's maybe the opposite of hope, they are driven by despair. So uh, I think the climate crisis you refer to, uh, I myself am involved in the biodiversity debate a lot. I think that's a much bigger problem. It's basically existential. Um, so if you take the science seriously and let that sink in, it's basically uh, we're done. Uh, if we don't completely change course. And when you look at what is happening in real life and the trillions of public money that are now uh, raised to basically save the old economy, uh, that's not a, a hopeful message. So um, I'm, I'm not going to tell here that the COVID crisis is, is uh, uh, opening up the door to a green uh, uh, utopian future where everybody's happy. Uh, that would be very naive. And, and um, so, Taking one step back, and you talked about tipping points, uh, we talk about transition points. There is a historical logic in, uh, in societal systems, uh, including political structures, uh, that we try to understand from this transition perspective. So what are transitions? It's basically a pattern of uh, uh, systems change uh, or, or nonlinear change in complex systems. They describe it in ecology, uh, you can uh, see it in the developmental psychology, uh, but we apply it to societal systems, like the economy or its subsectors. And what is the pattern? Uh, over time, we develop as humans certain routines and practices, power positions, power structures, uh, uh, economic positions, um, and they, we call them regimes, they're not necessarily bad, they're basically what uh, uh, keeps society together. Uh, like a faculty uh, around a specific discipline, a specific knowledge base, uh, with departments, with structures, an educational system, teaching students uh, a particular kind of knowledge, and then they go out and support uh, uh, the economy that is. So it's a, a way to uh, provide stability uh, to ensure continuity, while at the same time uh, society around us changes. So we develop different types of demands, preferences, um, uh, concerns, uh, like on climate change and, and biodiversity. Uh, we have uh, uh, technological revolutions, we have geopolitical shifts, we have demographic changes. And uh, this changing context puts pressure on these regimes, on these existing systems. And it destabilizes these uh, systems, the institutions, the structures, the way power is divided, the way we operate, how we have organized our economy and our lives. What always happens is that people start to do something else. So they deviate from the norm, they come up with completely new, transformative or radical ideas. Um, and at first they are really marginal, so they are uh, like uh, when I was young, people started, stopped eating meat or protest against fur industry, uh, or uh, uh, refuse to have a car. Uh, that was very alternative at the time, and now more, it's more and more common, it's more and more accepted. So 
what happens, and this takes decades to materialize, is that these uh, societal concerns and pressures on these uh, uh, incumbent structures, these societal regimes, increases. Internal tensions also uh, uh, um, um, grow, uh, and the competition becomes stronger. What a transition is then, basically, a shift away from equilibrium. So you use the tipping points, which is what, how they look at it in ecology, where they say at a certain point we pass a threshold and then the ecosystem flips in another state. In a societal context, it works in a completely different way. What is disruptive to, the, uh, to one is uh, uh, marginal to the other. So what is radical hope to the one is uh, maybe reasonable hope to another. Um, or what is radical hope to the other is the despair of the other. So, uh, we, in a societal context, it is fragile, and we, we use the word reflexive uh, and complex by definition. What we do see, however, is that there's a lot of signals that the current crisis is like a magnifier or an accelerator for already emerging transformative pressures. So, it accelerates the societal concerns over biodiversity, health, interconnectedness, economic vulnerability, uh, um, so more and more people uh, uh, become concerned. It also has put enormous pressures on these uh, healthcare, uh, food systems, energy systems, educational systems that were already struggling and are now temporarily being saved, but that is like postponing uh, uh, their transition, I would say. Uh, and it has stimulated all sorts of people to start engaging with these formerly alternative practices. Uh, working from home is one, but uh, I think uh, uh, eating healthy food, supporting your locals, there's all sorts of examples, and you gave the, the hopeful examples. But obviously we shouldn't be naive uh, uh, and, and uh, acknowledge that there's also uh, uh, a lot to lose in these transitions. So a lot of people are also uh, trying to uh, um, work against uh, these imminent transitions. They want to restabilize. Think of the angry farmers uh, that don't want uh, uh, to change, or think of the, uh, the flower sector, or the aviation sector, or the car industry. They all uh, uh, um, uh, fear transition um, and are in a position to uh, lobby for uh, political support. The same applies for uh, policy makers that uh, are also uh, afraid to lose uh, position, so they also uh, uh, might hope that things turn back to normal. So from a transition point of view, it's quite interesting to now see, uh, and, and I'm going to try and apply your different uh, types of hope to what a transition is. It's basically the process where new things emerge and become more competitive, it's existing structures that are forced to adapt and transform, and there are elements of uh, the old systems that are uh, fading out or are being destroyed or broken down or phased out. Um, and in each of these three dimensions, it really depends on uh, what kind of future you have in uh, mind, what you want to see um, as desirable. So it happens all at the same time. It's also a lot of new things like populism or uh, um, um, uh, people that want to uh, uh, stay in power and, and uh, uh, go back to their high consumption lifestyle, for example. That's also happening. So the question is, how do we make hope not an external thing, but a productive thing uh, uh, in this context of transformative changes. Because for me, it's evident, and there's a lot of evidence, like the ecologist, that points at um, an increasing destabilization of our fossil, linear, extractive global economy. It's, it just doesn't have a longer-term future. Um, it's an economic uh, uh, law. It's a, uh, uh, almost an evolutionary law. And there are alternatives emerging. So what we need to do is, is turn hope into a sort of a radical optimism where we dedicate our time and our money and our attention and our imagination, if, if that's uh, related to hope, uh, to what we want to see. Um, and part of the conversation I have in the biodiversity community is that 
people are so obsessed with the biodiversity decline and the problem that all they frame or see is the biodiversity decline. Well, at the same time, from my perspective, what I see is emerging uh, positive alternatives that are about a nature-positive economy. So it's ways to produce food and energy that are also beneficial for the environment. And, and if you then ask me as a person, I hope that these alternatives uh, uh, grow stronger um, and uh, will become the new normal. At the same time, I know that uh, me hoping, it, it doesn't mean anything. So I use my position uh, to um, create a kind of confidence and a belief, rather, that this alternative is possible. And I don't know which type of hope uh, uh, you refer to it. I don't think it's a radical hope, because that is imagining the impossible. And I think it's a, it's a given fact that we are heading for a decade of disruption. We are already in it. And it creates massive uncertainties. So we, we feel it uh, in society. Uh, uh, it will influence the political uh, uh, landscape in terms of populism, in terms of fluctuations. But it's also the only way that we have a chance of uh, uh, surviving uh, on the longer term or possibly thriving. Um, and I think yeah, it's, it's kind of a duty not to hope, but to act. Um, so I think uh, uh, the, my main point, and I'll so, uh, sum it up, it's the scientific approach to hope for me would be to uh, uh, unpack the current dynamics as an inevitable process of structural nonlinear transformative change and to make ho hope practical or uh, uh, productive, we need to translate it into a, a radical optimism and uh, hopeful action. Thank you, Thank you very much. <laughs> Somehow, um, uh, the, the first thoughts I had when, when listening to your uh, interesting talk is, the, the, the friction almost between perspective and some kind of uni universality that lies in, in hope. But I saw you writing down a lot, so maybe you would like to, to react first on Derek, and please also, uh, after that, the audience is uh, more than welcome to ask questions. Yeah, not, not all that I was writing down was a uh, reaction, so <laughs> don't panic. <laughs> I won't give another talk. But <laughs> um, no, I, um, well, I just wrote down some keywords because um, um, first, perhaps, to come to your last point, you said, um, well, you want to create this radical optimism or this stability of hope, perhaps, in a way that that change is still, or that some change is still possible, some change for the better. And um, I would say this, this could, could also be subsumed under this idea of reasonable hope, which I described rather on an individual level, so you need this hope that your actions can make a difference, and they can be worth, worth an effort, and this is, it is reasonable to but, hope. But you, sorry to that. interrupt, yeah. but you, you seem to suggest that you need hope for change, or that hope equals change. That people uh, that you connect hope to change, but there's also a lot of people that hope Correct. for Plus, not change. Yeah, yeah. And, and to me, it's completely disconnected because change is is happening. It's all around us. It's it's yeah. it, it doesn't matter what we hope or not. Uh, uh, things change. Yeah, but still, I think that um, I also wouldn't say that it's only hope that brings about change. But um, I think that if um, our actions, our individual actions, shall bring about change, or if we um, are going to be motivated to invest in such actions, then we need hope that they can make a difference, that they can have an effect. So if you lose all the hope that your, that your actions or your individual behavior can, make, can have an effect, then you won't act upon your hopes or your ideals. And of course, then there is another part of change that is these rather implicit or unconscious procedures of change that happen because people just change um, their habits um, um, or behavior structures change or um, well, p people like different things. Um, this is one side, but, but the other side is, well, if we really want, want to motivate people to change their behavior patterns in a certain way and we really want, want to direct this in a certain way, as you also want to do it, I guess, with this idea of 
transferring your hope into radical optimism, um, then we need some hope um, that individual changes can contribute to these overall changes. But I, I, uh, I, I don't want to change anybody's behavior. <laughs> uh, I, I think uh, uh, on the long run, uh, uh, what happens is that we all change our behavior. So, so we do things differently all the time. And, and uh, my conclusion is that in every act that we uh, do, we uh, influence change on a larger scale. So my background is more in social science mm. and structuration. So uh, the fact that we make different choices, and that's why I gave the vegetarian or the, the car-free example, uh, it starts maybe with individuals, and they do it out of principle, of, uh, out of concern, or uh, that they feel it's, it's better for them, not, not necessarily out of hope. But then more and more people think, oh, that's, that's all, I can also do that. And now the whole problem uh, that's, that's more a policy problem in the Netherlands, that they make these transitions into something like a government project that they're now going to tell people to change. Yeah. No, this is not, this is not what I meant. It's not about nudging people into uh, changing or something. But, but, but I think that you cannot deny that you yourself also cannot do this with a kind of hope. Because what you, but perhaps it's, it's a matter of, of, of uh, the, the concepts that we use that because you talked about this radical optimism that, um, in particular, if we talk about the climate crisis, for example, or of these um, disasters that are going to happen, um, then uh, if we give up all hope and think that we cannot change anything, so then it doesn't make sense to do anything. And then the, the idea that we should, that we have a duty to act and not to hope also doesn't make sense any longer because yes. then we can just resign and... We, we, I, I tend to use more the word of belief, yeah. which is also controversial in academia. But uh, I believe, for example, uh, I've been involved in the mobility transition in Rotterdam, that it's quite possible that within 10 years nobody has their own car anymore and all mobility is shared, uh, inclusive and electric. And it's technologically, economically possible. The only thing is that uh, it needs some uh, behavioral and political change. Mm. Um, but, I, I, but I can base it on facts. So I feel that if I uh, uh, say I hope that that will happen, then I can sit back and then uh, uh, say I, ho I just hope yeah. it. I, I believe and am convinced that it, it can happen and, we, and it already starts now and I can point at the places where it's already happening or the people that are already living this future. Yeah. Um, philosophers always have a conceptual trick to answer to things like that <laughs> because one can also say then that there is a distinction between um, passive hope where you're really awaiting something to come like perhaps sometimes in religious faith, uh, a messianic hope that the world will be saved uh, but there is also the idea then of active hope uh, which is really a motivational structure of um, activating people. And um, you talked about activism at the beginning and said that it is often driven by despair. And that's interesting because, um, well, in, in studies about the motivational structure of activists um, in, um, in, uh, who, yeah, who are active to fight uh, climate change, um, it has uh, been shown that there are different motivational settings. So in the global north, people are very often motivated by hope. Now, in the global south, people are much more motivated by fear, but also by anger and descriptions of guilt, guilt to the polluters because they feel that they are the victims of what happens. Uh, and that's their motivation to change things. But still, here in the global north, north uh, at least uh, many climate activists and uh, those who do research on, the, on this motivational pattern say, please don't evoke fears and don't uh, paint all these apocalyptic scenarios all the time, but give the people hope that um, there will be <laughs> a way out of that. <laughs> that is it, at least possible. I, yeah. I can understand the differences, uh, yeah. but there's also in the global north quite some people that uh, uh, argue from a climate psychology point of view that we first need to go through despair uh, before we can start rebuilding. Yeah, I would deny that because this is perhaps also the point that I wanted to make that some hopes uh, have to be disappointed to learn from that and then you could also put this in other terms and say sometimes really have to go to the despair, through the despair to develop hope again. Yeah. Yet, uh, Dick, uh, you say maybe they first have to go through despair. Uh, could you also argue that hope has something dangerous in itself? Well, I think that, that's, that's uh, what was said, that uh, there's also disappointment uh, in hope. So 
I, I think on a macro scale, maybe people shy away from hope uh, to prevent uh, uh, themselves from, from being disappointed. Uh, and, and I think the general problem in society is that, that there is no sense of progress or optimism, or uh, I don't know if hope is the word, but um, uh, we're so comfortable that any change seems like a threat. Uh, well, I see a lot of practices uh, that are about a more healthy, more social, more just, uh, a more inclusive, more sustainable economy uh, and lifestyle. Uh, so there's all the reason to be very hopeful about the future, but a lot of people are disconnected from that because they, they are in their own uh, uh, daily lives and, and uh, professions and, and uh, context and they only see uh, climate breakdown, uh, economic crisis, uh, political instability. Um, yeah. yeah. Maybe what, what I'm more looking for, uh, the, the word activity already felt a few times, uh, that hope is also something that that is lying somewhere over there and we don't have to act. And in that sense, that it could be more dangerous or harmful for that matter. So that, that there is all, always a relationship between hope and being active instead of, I hope that although it's corona, I'm going to party. Well, I, I think that's the, that's the difference between yeah. the passive and active hope I learned uh, uh, today. <laughs> so uh, uh, we're talking about active hope, I think, uh, but still uh, there is a big challenge on bridging the gap between hoping for something on the longer term and acting upon it or seeing it already in the now. So uh, policy makers have the tendency to, to uh, uh, externalize hope. They call it a, a vision or a plan or an ambition that someone uh, somewhere else in the future will actually do all that. Uh, uh, obviously, it's about acting upon what you hope for uh, in the small scale. So already uh, taking these principles uh, uh, for uh, that you uh, hope for on the longer term uh, as guiding principles for your daily decisions and, and actions. But another danger of hope that I, I see and that I also mentioned is that it cannot only be disappointed all the time, but it of, of course it can also be exploited. So, um, of course, even in this particular crisis, you also see that there are political promises that are made now or um, that some, some agendas are going to yeah, push through uh, and uh, that, that the hopes of people that are perhaps, first of all, just directed towards overcoming this situation are then, in a way, can be exploited for other purposes. And of course, sometimes perhaps for good purposes, but sometimes not. <laughs> I'm also looking at the audience. Are there some urgent questions or comments one would like to ask? No? Then, uh, then I'm curious about, uh, uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit more about uh, the fragile hope and how it relates to, well, at least I have the feeling, Derek, that you are more looking for a revolution in that sense. And somehow they, they, they seem to, to not go together very well. But maybe I, I, I can be wrong, but maybe you can elaborate a little bit about Are you looking that? for a revolution? <laughs> <laughs> or, um, <laughs> no, yeah, in relation to your fragile hope in that sense. Yeah. Uh, um, well, um, um, I'm just asking myself the question whether my idea of fragile hope means that a revolution won't take place or won't be possible. I think um, it doesn't really mean that we need a more cautious um, reform <laughs> approach, but I would say that um, well, whenever we hope something, we should be aware of the limits of hope and of the dangers of hope and of, of its own fragility. And also of the fact that, um, yes, of the fact that change happens all the time and that perhaps we have certain ideals now, but that it's very likely that they can look completely differently within some years because the situation is completely changing. Um, and then we have to be able, uh, this is why you said it's kind of an open idea of hope, but I think this is also a nice way of, of, of framing it, um, that it is open for change and it's not only directed on one ideal of a better world or something, but it's open for uh, change. And yes, as I said, it's aware of the fact that, in particular in, the, in this situation, this is something that came to my mind when I read all these very enthusiastic expressions of hope, um, that we will now change the world for the better and learn for the climate crisis, that I sometimes had the impression that the 
victims and the, those who are really suffering from the current situation are a little bit, little bit getting lost uh, and that, uh, well, let's rush into the future and, uh, well, we have just have to do with, or perhaps even, yeah, we misuse them as means then to, to these ends. And uh, this is something that I also wanted to uh, include in this idea of fragile hope. I think that that's good news that that it doesn't exclude. I mean that we both have a better future <laughs> and that no, we no. can have this fragile hope. And uh, I, I certainly see yeah. the, the 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 green washing or the the hope washing uh, uh, from a lot of uh, uh, policy makers or uh, people that argue now is the time to make this transition. Um, I, I think that's naive. At the same time, it serves a function and it signals this growing support for uh, transformative changes. But for me, uh, uh, a revolution is not a, a nice thing. A transition is also not a nice thing because there's a lot of destruction involved uh, and a lot of uh, societal uncertainty. And a revolution typically is a, a shorter time span. It's overnight and it's, it's the most destructive form. We say transitions are evolutionary revolutions. So uh, obviously it will take uh, uh, decades, uh, hopefully a decade, uh, to make substantial, significant changes um, in how our economy operates. And uh, what I hope for then is that uh, uh, it will be a structural change away from this linear extractive model. And I think uh, that includes the, the, the more fragile uh, 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 parts of our society globally, uh, including nature. Uh, and I think the only way uh, uh, forward, a future at least that, that would be one to thrive in rather than survive, is a, a just and sustainable one. Um, and I think that is acknowledged on more and more places, and it's also in our own self-interest. Of course, there's people still hoping that things won't change, but they uh, are, are smaller and smaller in numbers. Um, yeah. Should, should we do a poll? Who's still hopeful after this conversation? <laughs> Can you raise your hand if you're hopeful about the future? Ooh, it's... And, and who is uh, uh, negative about the future? So it's 50-50. It's I think that's a... Uh, uh, I don't know. Did, did we depress you or...? <laughs> Did everyone, did anybody change? <laughs> Can we ask uh, what, yeah, 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 a please. positive and a negative one? Yeah. yeah, you have to go with the microphone. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is there anyone who would like to, uh, yeah, because I, I can't speak through this mic. Thank you. You mentioned um, that you're not as much um, looking forward for revolutions because they're very destructive cycles, but more for uh, transitions. But then what, what do we do when we have such a short time to transition? Um, you do need a certain amount of revolutionary spice into this transition because that's just a fact. We have no more time to just wait for society to change itself. Especially, I think, if you look at the global south, uh, there are at least 50 years behind Western Europe, at least. So how do you tackle uh, that? You were hopeful or negative, or pessimistic? I, so, so, so. I, I would You're describe myself as I have <laughs> barely any hope, but since the outcome seems determined in, in any case, it's like, why not do something that at least makes me feel a bit better? So they still push me forward to action, but with a lot of skepticism. <laughs> Well, the, the, the question is, it, is it fast enough uh, uh, presumes that you have a timeline in your head and you uh, uh, soon enough for what, I would say. So transitions have their own pace and I uh, uh, see a, a societal revolution on all sorts of uh, accounts. So there's a technological revolution going, there's a climate movement going, there's uh, uh, businesses that are rallying uh, because they can uh, make a profit in a nature positive uh, business model. Uh, there's a whole movement in, in universities and academia. There's uh, hundreds of cities that are declaring climate emergency and are uh, adopting 100% renewable goals. So if you look with this eyes, and it's all maybe small scale and it's local, 
but that is also part of the future. And if you zoom out, and we do a lot of research in these communities, there are millions of people across the globe that are, are changing their lifestyles. Uh, so they are uh, building new markets, basically. Um, so from that perspective, there is already a, a global movement. Uh, and then is it fast enough? I don't know if it's a relevant question because it's so disempowering. What, you cannot change the pace. The only thing is that you can uh, work as hard as you can as a person uh, to be part of that change and to uh, affect others and to com contribute to building these new structures in whatever profession you're uh, uh, going to enter. So uh, would that be saying that the societal transitions kind of adapt their pace to, in a way, what is needed? Yeah, w uh, uh, more or less, but what is needed is also a subjective notion, but basically, so the nonlinear idea is one of exponential growth. So the interesting thing, of course, with the COVID uh, diffusion, it also has this exponential, but it's very difficult to understand as people how fast things go when they take off. And a lot of the uh, emerging sustainability transitions, they go back uh, decades. So they are, are they are only over the last five or 10 years do we really see, uh, start to see this uh, uh, upswing. The transition idea is that it's co-evolutionary. So while the alternative is accelerating and the problem is acknowledged by more and more people, they will start to destabilize all these structures from within uh, and that is, th those are, are the recipes for really uh, radical, uh, 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 quick changes. Is it quick enough? We, we can only uh, ask it on uh, to historians in the future. I had a question regarding what you were saying on fragile hope, but I think both of you might be able to add uh, some input. So it was pretty much about how we can hope if Right now, we have lots of people on top, big governments actually acting individually and all these huge corporate companies that keep exploiting. How can we hope if we already have a bunch of people above us that keep damaging the planet and our societies? <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> because it's really a tricky question, of course. Um, Yes, um, well, here, here's really the point where I say we must hope in a way, because um, otherwise, um, otherwise these social tra societal transformations uh, won't take place. That come, do not come from bottom up, um, but, 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 they, uh, yeah, but they are made by the people who change their lifestyles and their habits. Um, so um, in a way, um, but of course I understand, and this is perhaps, this can also then be another motivation that is rather coming from despair or anger that people start protesting against these structures because they feel powerless. Um, but uh, if they do, they must have at least a certain hope <laughs> that they can change something. So it's always, in a way, uh, this is perhaps also the idea of fragile hope. It's always an intertwinement of hope and despair or hope and anger and other motivations. And, and for me, so the historical logic is that there will always be powerful elites but they uh, 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 always come to an end as well. So the Roman Empire is also not uh, here anymore. So uh, th th this kind of uh, power shifts, they are also part of, of what we look at in transitions. And the interesting thing of the uh, digital revolution is the, the, and the, the, the fact that people are educated and we can uh, share knowledge and we can create our own uh, economies, basically, and democracies, is also giving all the uh, um, uh, tools that big corporations or uh, uh, political elites use, knowledge, resources, control, uh, they are now democratized. So a lot of the interesting alternatives are about uh, creating your own economy, basically, regionally. So cities, uh, together with cooperatives, with communities, with social entrepreneurs, uh, they can now uh, uh, create their own economies, and that uh, takes away the profit basis and the base for extraction of uh, uh, these elites. Um, obviously, those alternatives are now mainly accessible to, to people that can invest or have the knowledge or access. Uh, so 
part of, of what we feel is necessary is to uh, um, uh, spread this and make it much more inclusive and accessible for uh, people everywhere. I want to have a, a someone with despair. But, uh, <laughs> so you see yeah, people, okay, sorry. people oh, with online, despair don't online. act. <laughs> <They> don't. <laughs> online audience as well. And I have one that I like uh, by Esther Shoshana. And she asks, Derek, if you say that you are not interested in changing behavior, uh, what do you suggest that we should be focusing on? Is human behavior not the one most important of the most important aspects? Uh, that, that's a good point. Focus on changing the context. So uh, we saw at the peak of Corona, at the lockdown uh, in May, I think we had a global decrease of carbon emissions of 17%. And this was when the whole world was sitting at home. Um, so uh, we were still using the internet and so on, of course. Uh, but the point here being that the majority of our emissions and also the, the, the destruction of the planet is linked to industry, uh, to transport, uh, to, ev to produce everything uh, around us. And so individual behavioral change starts to matter when it adds up, when you have big groups of consumers doing di different stuff or big groups of people protesting, but then it's already collective. Um, I think as professionals or as academics or as voters or as consumers, we have an influence in uh, changing this context in um, uh, buying new products, creating a different uh, uh, demand, or put, uh, putting pressure on policy makers or decision makers to change the rules of the game. Uh, or like in the mobility here in Rotterdam, to just uh, uh, mobilize your street to uh, close it off for cars, to just change the physical environment so that people start to behave differently. Um, so it's nudging on a systems level, uh, maybe, rather than uh, trying to convince people to do something else. Uh, yeah, there is also someone who is called Giovanna Steinbeck Bruno, who says, stop thinking we have to give up cars. And I think that is a nice additive to this uh, comment that you just made. And then she says, new technologies must be implemented. We are still relying on old sources, politics, more democracy, must play a new role separated from finance. What do you, th what do you think about cars? <laughs> well, well, I have one, so I should say <laughs> about... Me too. <laughs> but, um, well, um, I think it is a good point to say that we need new technologies. And the question is, uh, well, do we have to abolish cars? whatever that means, driving vehicles to transport individuals, or will there be technological options to produce cars that are, uh, well, not harming the environment as much as cars do now? And so, um, but of course, this is also an aspect of, of hope in a way then, that, uh, of, or of pro optimism for technological progress that can be used to, to overcome these problems. Yeah, I think it's, uh, most of you will be aware of eco-modernism, which is the, the, the uh, approach or the, the statement that they say, look at all the progress the world is making in terms of reducing poverty and, and uh, uh, getting people educated and so on. Uh, technology will solve us. Uh, I feel that uh, uh, the way that we have organized the economy, it's very wasteful. So we waste a lot of food, we waste a lot of energy, we waste a lot of resources, and that is a profit model for uh, maybe the 1% or maybe the 10%. So the, the, this, uh, we can add more technology and we can solve a lot of problems with technology, but that doesn't solve the democracy, the injustice, and the, the wasteful nature of our uh, economy. So. Yes, and perhaps another thing to add, because you talked about, um, well, elites, uh, and, and you did as well by saying, well, they still have the power and influence, everything. But of course, if we look at, at these social, societal changes or transformations that take place at the moment, they are also more or less restricted to an elitist group of students, for example, academics uh, who changed their behavior. Or if we look back at the corona crisis, those who stopped flying um, to conferences or uh, for a weekend trip uh, abroad are, I guess, those who are more privileged. But um, the most 
common people usually really went very quickly back to normal and said, well, I am working all the time. I, am, I have deserved my holidays uh, in Spain and I want to do this and I want, don't want to change my behavior. And of course, this is then also um, uh, a problem that is showing, yeah, well, that, that these transformation also have to be made accessible, as you said, for everybody. So it doesn't help if we have very expensive uh, electric cars, but uh, nobody can buy them. We just need to bike. Yes. <laughs> um, I'll use my imagination with great strain to be optimistic, or at least try to be. Um, given as, as this, so this is a question for the both of you, both of you. So given the situation in which there are many systematic challenges, but also now opportunities because those systems are under great strain by the multitude of crises that we are faced. Um, isn't it uh, now f for us as an academic community, do we not have a duty now to cultivate uh, fragile hope? In a sense also to implore people into action or at least show uh, opportunities of action that have inclusive and democratic results. And if so, how do we sort of, um, yeah, help sustain or help cultivate this fragile hope. Yeah, I, 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 yes, uh, which is, uh, it's part of our mission at Drift to do this. Um, it's creating hope more. So the, the understanding of these inevitable transformative changes in our economy uh, as a way to uh, open up space for, for imagining a completely radical alternative futures to be possible, so it's more the radical or the, yeah. Um, but then also I, uh, being able then from that radical hope to identify uh, that uh, it's also already happening. So a lot of, we don't have to invent it as academics, it's already there, so we have to make it visible and, and uh, reasonable in a way, then we say, okay, it, on a small scale it already works, how do we make it accessible, how do we make it more affordable, how do we ensure it's also sustainable and inclusive? But that requires a sort of a normative engagement from academics that is uh, uh, not part of the academic regime that much, so it, it requires a transition of the university uh, and of academia. Um, but that transition is also happening, by the way, so... Uh, um, and the main thing is that we use our academic privileges and the methods and the tools and the access to knowledge and our ability to understand and interpret knowledge uh, to support these communities that are building uh, a better future. Yeah, cannot just add much. <laughs> of course, I agree to the idea that we have a duty to promote uh, fragile hope. Uh, um, uh, and uh, yes, um, I think, um, well, on the one hand side, we have perhaps a duty to reflect about that and to make it clear for ourselves uh, on this academic level. Um, but uh, but um, another, uh, and well, all the things that you mentioned are relevant and important as well. And I think another thing that is important is also not to forget the emotional level in particular, if we want to bring it or yeah, tr transfer it to, a, to the people and uh, to a broader public. and. Our arts can also be an option, I guess, to confront people with uh, um, questions uh, or ma make them think about their behavior patterns or, well, just um, transforming situations and, uh, well, giving them also, also a good, um, well, a good perspective for their individual life. So this, this is again this reasonable hope that, that the good thing can be, can lead to happiness <laughs> at the end as well. Are there any other urgent questions? Because otherwise I'd like to uh, pick up about uh, the, the emotional aspect uh, you were mentioning. Uh, I can imagine that, and I think a lot of people are also interested in, in the concept of hope because uh, they find it just very difficult or heavy these times to, 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 to be a student, for example. Um, to, to, to close up this session, I was wondering, uh, I, mean, I don't uh, want to ask you as a kind of psychologist or anything, but do you have any kind of tools or any tips 
uh, uh, one here in the in the room or maybe online could like keep their hope for for themselves in, in that sense. I mean, we are sometimes touching on a kind of meta hope once in a while here in this in this talk. But are there also very practical? Philosophical or transitional matters in that sense. I mean, uh, yeah. We, we we joke sometimes internally within our group about transition therapy. So, on the one hand, we feel it's a very comforting thought. If you, and that 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 is uh, relates to uh, the the message: inform yourself that uh, inevitably there will be more and more uh, momentum for transformative change. Uh, but it, it takes a while, so then you get frustrated that why, why is it taking so long? So on a practical level, what is also uh, uh, empowering is the realization that in every act that you uh, 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 take, in every person that you talk to, in every course that you take, in every product that you buy, uh, you are uh, potentially influencing uh, the kind of changes. And that is also... Um, if you start to bring curiosity and, and a radical optimism in it, um, uh, you can see all around you opportunities to contribute to uh, social changes. So you don't have to make the whole transition. That will happen anyway, but connect to uh, where it is touching the ground and maybe initiate something, uh, organize yourself, inform yourself. And that, uh, of course, that doesn't solve uh, unemployment or, or uh, lockdown or uh, illness or depression. But at least it's a way to start doing something and then you discover something more and then it, it starts to grow. Uh, so uh, allow for that growth to happen and then uh, yeah, that's the best I can do. Yeah, as a philosopher, of course, I agree to the curiosity point very much because philosophy begins in wonder and uh, being curious or wondering and or also seeing, well, th these are very simple and fundamental philosophical thoughts now, perhaps, but seeing seeing uh, what is, what, or asking oneself what really matters and what is really um, making your life meaningful can, of course, always be something that motivates your hope because then you can ask yourself, is it really, am I really actually losing something at the moment? And what is it? Or are there other things that are much more important uh, that I can also gain um, in this situation? Thank you. Well, I, I think we have a lot of f food for thought uh, to say. I think, well, at least I have to. And although I, on a certain moment, are like, oh, so far for hope. I think I can conclude that I'm still a pessimist. Thank you very much for... Uh, <laughs> you conclude you're still a pessimist. Yeah, that, uh... <laughs> so it didn't help at oh, all. I'm sorry, no, no, an optimist. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No. Uh, 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 thank you for being here, for your questions, for joining us. Uh, also, uh, in the virtual world, thank you for following us. Uh, if you didn't do so here in the physical world, please write down your uh, mobile phone number in the on the paper that is around here because of the new measurements. And please, one more uh, big thank for Dirk Lobach and Katharine Bauer. Thank you. Thank you.